a pleasure to be able to introduce you to a uh, brief former colleague of mine, uh, Daniel Holtz. So um, we've been trying to schedule him as a colloquium speaker for a long time, and he missed the window of being able to come in person, but we're lucky to have him remotely today. And I know his talk is going to be exciting. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about his background. Uh, so Daniel received his undergraduate degree from Princeton University and his PhD from University of Chicago. Uh, he had several postdoctoral fellowships at uh, Max Planck Institute in Germany uh, and the Kavli Institutes both in Santa Barbara and in Chicago. Uh, he was a Richard Feynman Fellow at Los Alamos National Lab. And then he went back to Chicago as a faculty member in 2011. Um, I, from my perspective, somewhere in there, I'm not sure where, in 2006 or 2007, I was, uh, Daniel and I overlapped at Carnegie uh, Observatories in Pasadena, California. He was there for a few months and I had the pleasure of getting to know him a little bit. Um, and I'm really glad that I did looking back on that experience because well, I, I enjoyed getting to know him, but also because uh, a few years ago when I was an observer at, uh, in Chile on um, August 17th of 2017, um, I was very pleased to be able to uh, assist, I guess, with the observations. I mean, I was the observer at the time um, for the uh, gravitational wave event that happened, the binary neutral star merger that I've talked to you all about in the past. Um, and uh, I'd like to tell the story, I've actually told the story many times, Daniel, um, that uh, it was a, a lot of my colleagues that were involved in the project that I was there uh, not notionally observing for, that was interrupted by this event, um, were all very excited. We were all very excited. And then we, we had the Skype call or this Zoom call, I guess. Um, and everyone was trying to tell me what to do. And, you know, I, I'm a pretty experienced observer. And so I knew what I was going to do. And everyone just was talking over me and not letting me get a, a word in edgewise. And Daniel got on the, on the call and said, listen, everyone shut up. Jennifer's in charge you guys you need to keep your mouth shut and let her do what she's going to do because she knows what she's doing and it was i very much appreciated that experience and I, I loved thinking back to that so i appreciated that daniel and i'm glad i had that experience with you in the past so i'm looking forward to hearing more today about what you're what you've been doing since then and uh, your talk about uh, your work on gravitational wave science Okay, Th thanks for that nice introduction. And I, we were very lucky you were on the telescope then because it would have been a shame <laughs> if things hadn't worked out. And there is kind of a global lesson here, which is, you know, it's good to, you know, get to know people and you never know when interests overlap and when, you know, when things will, will go this way. But that was, at least for me, still by far the most exciting scientific experience. I mean, I just can't imagine anything that's going to surpass that. And, and you know, the data was really phenomenal results. So I'll talk a little bit about some of those results along the way. Okay. Um, so um, thanks for having me here. And I'm sorry it, it took so long. And I'm really sorry not to be there in person. Um, but such are the times we live in. Uh, so um, uh, what I'm going to do is give kind of an overview of some recent results in the field of gravitational wave astronomy and gravitational wave physics. Um, my, my plan, uh, I mean, so there's, it's, it's a new field. My, my, my goal is to just give you some of the flavor of the kinds of questions we're asking and answering um, and not to give you kind of a deep dive on any one topic. And so, you know, if there's something you're really fascinated by and you want to hear more, then please just, you know, either interrupt me or you can ask after. Um, but I'm going to kind of touch on a lot of different things. And my goal is at the end, you get some sense of this kind of amazing new field and, you know, what it's like to you know, open a new window uh, on the universe. So, okay. Um, so to start, and I should say I'm focusing mostly on my own work. Um, instead of LIGO collaboration work. Um, I'm assuming you've probably heard about a lot of the LIGO collaboration work, and I'll touch on some of the results uh, along the way, um, but, but much of the talk is going to focus on uh, my own work and sort of, you know, okay, here's a LIGO discovery. What, what does it teach us? And that's kind of the, so, the sorts of questions I'm most interested in. 
Okay, so to start, um, okay, so just to give you some sense of, of you know, what it's like when you have a brand new field start up. Um, so here are some of the papers from the last year um, in, in my group. Um, and, and, and I'll touch on, you know, a, a bunch of these, but uh, it's there are a range of topics. Um, some of them have to do with individual events like this don't fall into the gap, which I'll talk about. Some of them have to do with the equation of state of neutron stars. Um, a lot of them have to do with populations and understanding how you make black holes and neutron stars in the universe, what, what gravitational wave detections tell us about uh, those things. Um, I have a long-standing interest in doing cosmology with gravitational wave sources, so uh, there's some, some papers relevant to that. Um, and then um, there's some other papers uh, having to do here, this is uh, actually a fun paper, which hopefully I'll talk about briefly, um, combining the stochastic background with individual measurements to learn about the full redshift distribution out to high redshift. Um, and most of these have to do with populations. When we have many detections, how do we, how do we learn new things from the population as a whole? So, you know, these are, oh, and then there's some, some work on lensing as well, which is quite interesting, I, I think. So, um, so there's a lot, you know, here, um, and I'm just gonna pick, pick a few of these papers, recent papers um, to focus on. But if, you, if something here catches your eye, let me know, and I'm happy to talk about that as well. Okay, um, so just to set the stage, so I'm gonna assume everyone's heard about, uh, you know, what is a gravitational wave? and what is LIGO and you know, the first discovery and things like that. If not, let me know. And, and again, I can I give more, but what I'm gonna do is kind of jump in, assuming you're more or less familiar with some of the things I'm sure Jen has talked about it. And I, I think you had a talk from uh, Marcelli Soros Santos. Um, and so you're probably kind of, the background is, is there. So I'm gonna assume that and I'll, I'll try to fill in things as I go along. Um, so what I'm mostly going to be talking about is LIGO's third observing run, which just finished this past March and finished about a month early because of the pandemic. Um, but we got you know, quite a bit of data. Um, we uh, had sent out roughly 60 alerts. So now we're running in a mode where if we detect something that might be interesting, we issue an alert right away. And then you know, Jen can go to a telescope and point and hope to see something. And so that happens automatically before we even really vet the candidates. And so the 60 alerts gives you some sense of how many things we might have detected. We have not officially published our catalog yet. That should come in the next you know, month or so. Um, and, but what we've done is published a few events along the way that we thought were partic particularly interesting. Um, and so when those came up, we immediately kind of analyzed them and, and wrote papers and published them. Um, but there are a whole many there are, there are many more that haven't been published yet. Um, we were much more sensitive than the previous run, and so I'll just remind you: at the end of O2, we had ten binary black hole detections and one binary neutron star, and now we're up, you know, at least another you know fifty-ish or something. And so you know we're really increasing uh, the the population, and that's great. And so I'll be talking a lot about that. We've had it was three, actually it's now four. We, just a few weeks ago, we announced our uh, GW1905-21. So that's our fourth discovery from 03. And I'm gonna, I'll talk about each of these discoveries in turn now, um, just because, just in case you miss them and just it gives you some sense of what we find interesting now. So I'll just remind you, just to set the stage, we had the first discovery, GW1509-14, that was, of course, incredibly exciting. And that was the first binary black hole. That was a 30 30. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that uh, there was a lot of work. And we did, had all these you know, confirmation of GR, uh, confirmation that black holes exist, uh, that gravitational waves, you know, are the way we expect them to be. That was a big deal. And that was the kind of Nobel Prize and all that stuff. And then there was GW170817. That was the multi-messenger source. I'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. Um, and then there have been a few other sources that you know, have been kind of interesting for various reasons along the way. Um, 
here are four more and each of them is different in its own you know this is what happens now we start to have a population if you get another 30 30 solar mass black hole people are less excited i mean we still find it very exciting but you know the rest of the community is like well we already have one or two of those who who cares so now what we call interesting changes and so here are the some of the interesting events so far in o3 okay so uh, the first i'll talk about is 1904-25 um, which was you know, another binary neutron star event. And so, of course, that got us extremely excited right away. Um, but um, in this particular case, uh, we didn't find a counterpart. Um, it was not particularly well localized. Um, what's weird about this binary neutron star event is also that the total mass is, is a little high. It was 3.4 solar masses, um, which is just, you know, this is just a little higher than we might expect, um, you know, from a normal binary. And so um, when, when you're trying to understand how you make binary neutron stars and what the properties, properties of neutron stars are, th this is something that doesn't quite fit into the known populations. Um, so if you ask <laughs> electromagnetically, what do we know about binary neutron stars? They're not usually this massive. Okay, so that, that you know, that's something we spend a lot of time making sure we had the masses right. This is where we are. And, and you know, I can talk more about that, but this kind of is a clue about neutron star equation of state, which is one of the most interesting questions um, uh, in the field, which is what is the nu neutron star equation of state, you know, which is the equation of state, the kind of properties of the matter at the hearts of neutron stars and neutron stars are the densest matter in the universe, cold matter. And so, you know, understanding what those properties are is, is something we'd really like to be able to do. And this is one of the very few avenues we have about, the, about to, to explore that. Okay. Um, after that, we had 1904-12. Um, and I particularly found this one fascinating. This was a binary black hole event where the bigger black hole was 30 solar masses and the smaller black hole was only eight solar masses. Um, and okay, I mean, that may not strike you particularly, but what was interesting is up until this binary, <clears throat> all the black holes we detected were consistent with being equal mass. Um, and so uh, there's a paper I wrote with a graduate student, Maya Fischbach, <clears throat> where we showed that, um, that they're all equal mass, uh, potentially. And, and this is a clue to how they form. <clears throat> so you can, if you have different models for formation, you end up with different mass ratios. And, and some formation channels might say, okay, you make two black holes, but there's no reason one black hole can't be much smaller than the other. And other formation channels say they must be more or less the same. And, and so the distribution of the mass ratios is very interesting. And this was the first binary <coughs> where it's, the mass ratio is not one, sorry. Okay. So that's also you know, quite interesting for various re reasons. <clears throat> and to really understand it, you have to do a lot of work um, <clears throat> on this binary synthesis side. I'm sorry, I may need to go get water. <clears throat> okay, you know what? I'm gonna go get a glass of water. I will be right back. Okay, let's we'll see if that one one advantage of being home. Um, okay, so um, uh, the next announcement was 1908-14. Uh, and this was um, also surprising. In this case, we had a black hole for sure, 23 solar masses, and now an even more extreme mass ratio. Um, and the, the secondary, the lower mass object is, is in this weird range, it's about 2.6 solar masses which makes it either the most massive neutron star ever detected or the least massive black hole ever detected. And from the gravitational waves alone, we don't know which it is. We don't have enough uh, information about the tidal properties of the secondary. And so we're just stuck being confused. 
either way, it's a revolutionary object. So either way we win, but, um, but we don't know <laughs> which it is. Um, it's, it's right in this sort of mass gap. And I'll talk about mass gaps. One of the themes of this talk will be, you know, mass gaps. So you'll, you'll hear more about that. Okay. Um, okay. And then finally, just a few weeks ago, we announced 1905-21. Um, and, and this black hole, this source is probably, I would argue, is the most surprising thing we've detected so far. So given everything else we've detected, all these events that have been announced, um, you know, I would say none of them are particularly surprising or shocking. Um, uh, now, you know, you could view that as, you know, kind of exciting and reassuring, or you can view that as incredibly depressing, but that's kind of where we've been. Everything has more or less agreed. Some people were surprised that there were black holes that were 30 solar masses, but I think many in the population synthesis community found that to be quite reasonable. Um, the distribution looks reasonable. Everything kind of fits. I mean, we don't really understand the rates. There are a lot of details we'd like to fill in. But there's nothing where relativity says, or astrophysics says, this source shouldn't exist. And so for the most part, things have been OK up until this event. This event is something that a lot of people thought should not exist, uh, myself included. And it's um, because this is an event which, where both black holes are unusually massive. The primary black hole is about 85 solar masses and the secondary black hole is 65. Both of these are more massive than any of the black holes we've detected before. And of course, then they merge and they create a black hole that's 140, which is by far the more, most massive black hole that we've detected within LIGO that we've seen formed. And so this is a big deal, uh, in particular because these masses are high, but not so high as to be okay, they're right in this thing we call the parent stability supernova. And so that gap is something where it's been predicted there should be no black holes. And yet here we have a binary which has two of them. And so um, I, mean, I think I'm going to just spend a little time talking about these gaps because they'll keep coming up um, as, as I go along. Okay, so here's the idea. You, what, what we're going to talk about is the distribution of black hole masses. And you know what's going on underneath all of this is that you have to have some model for how you make black holes in the universe. And the, the standard model that we have for these sorts of mass black holes is that you start with a star, and the star, if it, you know, it burns its fuel and eventually runs out of fuel and collapses, um, and then maybe there's a supernova and various things happen, and at the end, the star will leave behind some compact object in many cases. If the star is big enough, um, you know, so first it might be a, a white dwarf and then you know, it might be a neutron star. And if the star gets big enough, it leaves behind a black hole. And so what I'm showing here is kind of some sketch. This is a sketch done by Jose Maria Esquiaga, who's a postdoc at U Chicago. Um, and he just, I thought it's, kind of neat and the jumping will make sense as we go along. Um, but the idea here is what is the distribution of black hole masses? And what the theory says is that there will be some, you know, minimum black hole. You need a star that's big enough to create a black hole. If the star is smaller than some limit, then it doesn't create black holes anymore. It only creates neutron stars. And so there is some lower limit to uh, how, you know, how massive a black hole can be from a star. And so there's some minimum black hole mass. There is some maximum neutron star mass, and that's based on neutron star theory. And so um, neutron star theory says you get to some maximum, and then if you add, you know, one more proton, then the whole thing um, collapses to a black hole. And so, um, you know, Beyond that, you just can't have neutron stars anymore in nature. And so there's this question of whether there's a gap, and that's the lower gap, what we call the neutron star gap, between the most massive neutron star and the least massive black hole. In principle, black holes can be any mass. Uh, in principle, black holes could be the mass of the Earth. In principle, black holes could be 
you know, the mass of a cup of coffee. It does, there's nothing in GR that says that black holes can't be of any mass, but to make a black hole is not so easy. Um, you know, so for the Earth, if you want to turn into a black hole, you'd have to take the entire Earth and squeeze it into, you know, a region about this big. And, you know, that's pretty hard. And, you know, nature, it's not so easy to do that. Stars are a very good way to make black holes, but we haven't come up with that many others. There might be primordial black holes in the very early universe. There are other theories, but they get more speculative. The standard theory is it comes from stars, and that would imply there's some lower limit. What we don't know is whether there's a gap between the minimum mass of black holes and the maximum mass of neutron stars. There have been some observational evidence, mostly electromagnetic observations, have said there's evidence for a gap somewhere between, say, two and a half and five. There don't appear to be any compact objects, but we don't really know. And, and this LIGO-Virgo data gives us a chance to explore that. So that's the lower gap. Then for stars that are big enough, you, you form a bunch of black holes. And then there's another gap called the pair instability supernova gap. And that's something you know, that's been predicted for a few decades now. And the idea there is if you have a big enough star, so what you're doing is you're getting bigger and bigger stars and they create bigger and bigger black holes. But when your star gets really big, at some point the core gets so hot that you can spontaneously pair produce. And so you start producing pairs, E plus, E minus pairs, and, and that drains a bunch of energy. The star collapses, gets even hotter, creates even more pairs, and the whole thing runs away. And what you end up with, if you kind of run it through, is the star explodes in an incredibly luminous supernova called the parent stability supernova and leaves nothing behind. And so the theory predicts that there's some maximum mass of black holes, then there's a gap where this parent stability supernova thing happens. And then for really humongous stars, um, that doesn't stop the star from collapsing. There's so much matter, the star just co directly collapses to a black hole, and then you start forming black holes again. So the theory has predicted that there's this gap called the parent stability supernova gap. Um, so that's where you know, theory was, there should be, maybe there's a gap at the low end, and then there's this gap in the middle, um, okay? And now, if we go back to this detection, this is 1905-21, the one from a few weeks ago. And what I'm showing here, and we show a lot of plots like this, this is the mass of the primary on the x-axis, mass of the secondary on the y-axis. So this is the heavier black hole, this is the lighter black hole, and this contour shows you our best guess for what the masses are based on the data. And you can see that the primary, you know, it's somewhere around 80. And the secondary is somewhere around, you know, 65 or 70, something like that. So here are the, you know, if you, if you marginalize out each one, here's what you get for secondary, and here's what you get for primary masses. These are all big. So to guide your eye, I'm gonna show you where theory says no black hole should exist. Okay. So theory says the primary doesn't exist here, that you can't make a black hole from a star in the range of, you know, 50 to 120. That's what theory says. And for the secondary, theory says, well, you can make a black hole below about 50, but not above. Now, I should also point out, at, you know, at this point, you know, we've had a bunch of detections from, um, from 01 and 02. And, and in fact, uh, Maya and I wrote a paper called Where Are LIGO's Big Black Holes? Where we showed that already in the 0102 data, you've detected a bunch of black holes, you detect them up to about 30, 30, or maybe slightly more, and then you haven't detected any that are even more massive. And that's really surprising because the more massive the black hole, the louder the gravitational waves, the easier they are for us to detect. And so, you know, we said, oh, look, you know, there's clear evidence that there's a drop in the population. And we were really excited about that because that agreed with this parent stability supernova predictions. And, you know, it was just a beautiful story. LIGO is detecting black holes. They get up to about where you expect and then they all disappear. 
And that story worked until 1905-21, which threw the story into complete disarray. And now here we are with this one system where both of the black holes appear to be in this gap. Okay, so that's why this event is so, so exciting. Um, now let me, um, hold on a sec. Um, okay, uh, so now, there we go. Okay, and this is just, I, I don't expect you to go through this table, but you know, one thing to keep in mind, we detect the gravitational waves from a system like this, then we do a bunch of parameter estimation. Um, these different columns represent different waveform families. We have to describe general relativity and we can't run numerical simulations at every data point. So, so we, we have these families. I can talk a lot more about the way this works. This is kind of to give you some sense of what's going on underneath the hood as we estimate parameters. Um, and at the end of the day, we end up with the masses and then we get some estimates for the spin. We don't measure spin very well. The uncertainties are huge. Um, and you know, uh, a bunch of other parameters like the distance um, and the localization area. Okay, so that's what gravitational wave analysis looks like. We could spend you know, a few hours just talking about how this process works um, and what the nuances are there, but uh, I'm gonna skip that for now just to say, we do the analysis, this is what we end up with. Um, one interesting thing about this um, is that this is the most massive black hole we've had. And because of that, it merges, the frequency where it merges happens to be in a particularly sensitive spot for the LIGO Virgo detectors. And so we can measure the final, pro the, black, the properties of the final, the merger and the ring down of the black hole better than usual. And so here we, we show that the final spin um, is about 0.7 for the black hole. And we can kind of estimate that based on the in spiral. So you have the black holes that are still far away, getting closer and closer. And then, you know, and we can measure a little bit of that. And then we can predict what the final spin should be from that. And then we have the, the actual gravitational waves from the merger ring down. We can measure the spin and then we can compare. And these are the sorts of comparisons we get. This is all to say it all kind of fits together. Um, there's some stuff about high order modes and things which are, um, you know, also interesting and ways to learn about relativity. Um, that's a whole other talk. It's also fascinating. Uh, I'm gonna skip over that for now. Okay. So at the end of the day, we're left with this one source, 1905-21, which does not fit. That, that black hole, that pair of black holes should not exist. Um, and so the question is, you know, <laughs> what's going on? And you know, a lot of people in the community, this is all they're thinking about at the moment, trying to understand how this binary could possibly exist. And there are a few possibilities. One is that the pair instability physics, this science of how the pair instability supernova mechanism works is just wrong. And somehow the pair instability doesn't, doesn't come in or doesn't blow up totally or so, something happens. You can fiddle with metallicity and try to change things. People are hard at work trying to do that. It's not so easy, but you know, theorists are clever. They'll probably come up with something. Um, another possibility is that the, there's something wrong with the data. Our analysis, we just, we're, we're off base. Um, and and you know, maybe it was just noise and we're interpreting it as a signal. Well, we think that's very unlikely, but you never know. Or you can come up with more creative solutions. The most popular one is something called hierarchical merger, where what happens is you create smaller black holes. So you have normal black holes, they merge, they create a bigger black hole, and then that big, bigger black hole merges with some other bigger black hole and you just keep going. And so you can imagine if you have just a C, like in a globular cluster or an AGM disk, you have a lot of stars, they form a lot of black holes. The black holes are kind of pairing up, merging, making bigger black holes, which then continue to pair up and merge. There's this kind of hierarchical model. And that would explain how you end up creating black holes that are in this gap. The stars made smaller black holes, but then those merge and you made bigger black holes. And that story kind of works, but you have to get the rates right. And, it's, you know, there are a lot of details and the devil is in the details. Really making this a coherent story is, is not easy, but people are certainly trying and making progress. 
Um, and then you can imagine, you know, changing other things. Maybe it's not a binary system, you know, in kind of a circular orbit, but it was a high eccentricity or a head-on collision and we're just misinterpreting it. That would create a different set of masses. Maybe there's lensing. People have gotten very excited about lensing and I've also gotten excited about lensing. Lensing would change certain things and you might interpret, um, you, it would mess up the masses and I can talk about that more. Maybe it's primordial black holes or, you know, cosmic strings or who knows? We don't know what's going on. Um, so that's a particularly interesting source. Um, since I have the floor, I'm just gonna spend a few minutes talking about, you know, my, my favorite idea for what's going on, um, which is something uh, that uh, I just posted with, uh, with Maya Fischbach, a Chicago grad student, who actually she's now a postdoc. She's just starting at Northwestern. Uh, as a po postdoc with Vicky Caligara. Um, and so this is uh, this idea we call it don't fall into the gap or uh, minding the gap is I think we're going to change the title to minding the gap. Um, and, and the idea here is quite simple, but it, it, I think it's, it's helpful to go through it because it gives you some sense of some of what's going on when we present these nice mass results. Um, so so the point is, if you want to say, what is the mass of this binary black hole system? Um, okay, I'm going to do the standard thing about Bayesian versus frequentist. You know, you have to have a prior. You have something in the back of your mind about what the possible masses are. And in the normal LIGO analysis, this LIGO-Virgo results that we present, where we give you the masses, our prior is what you call uninformed. We assume it could be at any mass, and they're all equally likely. And when you do that, you get these masses right in the gap. But, you know, we have some theory and we have some data. The data says very clearly there is some sort of gap. Um, and the theory says very clearly there should be some sort of gap. And so it seems a little weird to completely ignore all that, both the data and the theory, and just analyze as if you know nothing about the population. Um, I'll also add that, you know, theory says like these hierarchical models say, well, you could make one black hole that's in the gap, say 85 solar masses, by having smaller black holes merge. But making a binary of two black holes, each of which is in the gap, that's much harder to do. And you would expect that to be a tiny fraction of the population. Even in the kind of generous scenarios, you're usually talking about one in a million. And we've only gotten, you know, maybe 50 of these. And now we already have one that has two in the gap, and we haven't seen any where there's one in the gap. It's very suspicious. So what we advocate, and what Maya says is, let's take a prior. You have to have some assumption. Instead of assuming we don't know anything about the population, let's assume that the lighter black hole um, is part of our whole population. Let's assume that the lighter black hole is part of the population of all the black holes we've seen before. Okay. When you do that, something miraculous happens, which is that the heavier black hole becomes heavier. And that's because what we really constrain is the total mass of the black holes, M1 plus M2. And so if M2 goes down, M1 has to go up. Um, and so this is what you end up with. And I, I just think this is kind of neat. Now, this is the same data. The analysis we're doing is the only thing we've changed is we've said that M2 is um you know similar to uh all the other masses we've gotten and when you do that you find that m2 is probably lower so in the purple ones are what ligo and virgo have produced they're uninformed prior so we don't know anything about the masses the green contours are what you end up with if you assume you know a few things about the masses um, in particular that the lighter one is consistent and what you find is that now these green contours kind of come down and to the right. And in particular, the grayed out regions are the regions that involve binary systems in the gap. This white box here is bi no binary systems in the gap. What you have here is the lighter black hole is below, below the gap at, you know, say 40-ish solar masses or 35 solar masses, just like all the other ones. And then if you do that, the heavier black hole is actually above 120. And so by making this assumption that 
you know, instead of having both of these in the gap, one of them at least is like all the others, the other one automatically goes above the gap and you don't have to throw out all of your parent stability supernova theory and everything just kind of fits. And so we find this to be quite, quite exciting and interesting because it kind of changes instead of this binary, um, you know, becoming, uh, you know, this binary that just doesn't, you know, just comes out of nowhere and kills all this theory and all the observations so far. What it does is it kind of splits and one black hole is fine and the other one is just the most massive black hole and we expect to have ones at 120 or higher and there now we have our first. Now, we have no idea if this is right or not. This is all based on priors. This is the nature when you only have a few objects or in this case, one system. But as we get more data, either we'll detect more binaries like this, in which case we'll know, oh yeah, we get what we call straddling binaries. They straddle the gap or um, we don't, and we get a bunch of black holes in the gap, and then we'll be able to tell these apart. And so the final, you know, moral here is with one system, um, it's just too soon to tell. You really need a population, and that's where we're headed naturally into population astrophysics. Okay. Um, so, you know, bottom line with this is we might be in the bottom right of this plot, and, and that would be great from a theory perspective. Okay, so um, maybe I'll just pause for a second now to see if there are any questions and then I'll talk about, um, you know, some more familiar results with uh, 170817 multi-messenger astronomy and some, some other, you know, things having to do with black hole populations. Um, so if there are any burning questions or clarifications. Uh, Can I, ask, I have a question for, about the Bayesian statistics. You would not have done those statistics had you not had the problem that you see. So how do you include that in the prior? Because you would not have been screwing around the prior if it had, if it had fit the theory. Yeah, so, so actually for most of our analyses now, we try to do population informed priors. We, since we now have a population of systems that we've detected, it makes sense to use the, that detected population to inform your priors. And so, um, you know, this is something that there's a lot of discussion, you know, within the collaboration about the best way forward uh, in general. But, um, you know, there's a group of us uh, that work on the population. There's, there's a, what we call a rates and population group. And in that group, you know, we advocate that you have to use the whole population to inform your priors. And so we would naturally have done this analysis, except because this was an exceptional paper, we can't publish the population yet. It's not been published, so we can't use the population because it's not public. So we were forced to do this uninformed analysis, um, which is kind of, I mean, that's just the way the order of the papers came out. So that's all a long winded way to say, I agree with you, you have to choose what priors to use. Um, the generic approach is to choose uninformed priors. But as we get more of a population, we're switching to always do the analysis with population priors. And then if something is really inconsistent with the population, then you can consider going from there. But as a first pass, it makes sense to always use the population to inform what you're doing. And um, for what it's worth, um, if you're interested in this, there's a, a paper I, uh, I wrote with Will Farr and Maya Fischbach, where we specifically address this question of population outliers and how to do these analyses. And what we show is if you don't use a population prior, you're going to confuse yourself. And the example we use, it just so happens, is big black holes. And we show that if your population has a sharp edge at, say, 45, the universe does not make black holes bigger than 45 and you analyze the black holes without using a population prior, just uninformed, you will detect black holes at 60, 70, 80 solar masses because just of the noise will create, you know, some black holes There will always be statistical outliers and you'll be convinced you have an 80 solar mass black hole, even though none exist in the universe. And that's because you're using the wrong priors. So, so, we're, not, so we're not to trust the, the errors that are quoted in the tables that come out in these papers? Well, what I would say is, if you think that this is its own population, like this is not connected to anything we've detected before, then this is 
these are the errors you get. Okay. And that's just uniform priors. If you think that the secondary is part of the population, then you can look at you know, our paper and those are the errors that you get. Um, now, our analysis is tricky because we're saying the lower one is part of the population, but the other one is not. And that's also weird. So the real moral here is we just need more statistics. Um, but in every case, when we quote, quote errors, you should make sure you understand the, the priors because often the, 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 what we, our results will shift depending on what priors you use. Um, so all of this is to say individual events are always tricky and that's not you know, that we're doing something wrong. It's just that's the nature of statistics. Population, populations are the way to go. Thank you. Could, could you repeat what was wrong with the uh, hierarchical merger explanation, especially since we're seeing all these mergers? Yeah, so I, you know, the question with the hierarchical mergers, I mean, it's a very interesting, you know, idea. The, the question with those, um, well, there are a number of questions. They make some robust predictions, like if it's hierarchical mergers, the black hole should be spinning and you can look for spin and you can ask whether that's consistent and there's something there. But the bottom line is, when you have a hierarchical merger scenario, um, you need to make, you make bigger black holes and those merge and then you make even bigger black holes and you need the kind of relative ratios to work out. Um, and one of the things that often happens, certainly in globular clusters, maybe is not, not as much in the AGM disk, is that when you merge, you get a kick, the gravitation waves emit momentum, linear momentum, and your final black hole is moving. And for many globular clusters, the kick will shoot you right out of the cluster. And so you inhibit additional mergers. So you have to kind of get the details right so that you actually keep, you retain the black holes and then you make these additional generations and then the, the, the relative rates of the bigger ones and smaller ones fit. And all of that uh, has been difficult. Now there are people in the AGN disk community that claim that they can do it and it's all fine. Um, but um, my impression is it's very hard to to account for two events in the gap given the rest of the population we have so far. So you can imagine those are created in globular clusters at some very high rate for reasons we don't understand. And then the rest of the black holes are not created in clusters. You could come up with some model like that, but that starts to seem a little contrived. So we, we don't know. There's a lot more work to be done. It would have been fine if only one of them was in the gap and then it would have been totally okay. But well, even though they're not kicked out or something, but yeah, I mean, it's you know half as good or half as bad depending on your point of view. But yeah, I mean, you could imagine there's only one, and we can come up with models that do that. That's easier to make than having two in the gap. Um, but we don't have that option here. It's either two in the gap or on opposite sides. It's harder to make just one in the gap. Um, but you know, maybe, I mean, statistically, that's if, if you have the appropriate priority, we could make one in the gap. So again, with one source, it's just hard to know. And so, I mean, it's very exciting because this might be the first time we have a, you know, a real hierarchical merger. If that's the case, you know, we would expect to see others and, and, and you know, we'll, we'll know soonish um, in the next two or three years. But it's very exciting because it's a whole different way to make these systems. So we have about 15 minutes left. So I'll okay. ask everyone else to hold their questions until the end. All right. Um, okay. So, um, you know, this is just a movie. You've probably seen this movie of 170817. This is the binary neutron star merger where not only did we get the gravitational waves, which you're seeing right now, but then we got, um, you know, of course, optical that Jen saw. Um, we also got gamma rays two seconds later, and then we got radio and, you know, the full range. And it's, you know, the most beautiful, I think the most beautiful event ever in astronomy. Um, okay, I'm a little biased, but I think a lot of people would agree. It's really a sensational event. Okay, so I'm not going to go into the details of this. I'm just going to pick a few topics and just kind of address them, because I think it just shows you the power of multi-messenger astronomy and what happens when you open up a new window. And so um, here's one question you can ask right away. Uh, do gravitons or really gravitational waves, do gravitational waves and light, do they travel at the same speed? So you can ask that. And 
Um, what you find is that the answer is uh, yes. Before this event, we weren't sure. The limits were very weak and contentious, to be honest. Um, but now what we got is we got in this system, you might remember, we got the gravitational waves, the neutron stars merged, and two seconds later, we got this burst of gamma rays. Um, and that two second time delay, okay, that sounds like a long time in terms of the speed of light, but you have to remember that for a hundred million years or so, the gravitational waves and the light were coming at us, hundred million years, and then they arrive within two seconds. And so that tells you the speeds are similar to about one part in 10 to the 15 or better. And so that one observation, which you know, many of us knew immediately, like there was the binary uh, neutron star, we knew the time of merger, there was a gamma ray burst, and, and we immediately knew, oh, we've measured to, yeah, I mean, it's back in the envelope, we've measured this to one part in 10 to the 15. And that's an extremely strong constraint. It tells us that gravitational waves travel at the speed of light, or really the way I would say it is light travels at the speed of gravitational waves, and that's what's expected, but you really want to observe it, and now we've observed it and measured it and shown it to be true. And that's a big deal. And that it sort of came free. Like, you didn't, it's not a hard analysis. It's just a gift. Oh, here, by the way, here's a 15 order of magnitude constraint confirmation of theory. OK. Um, another question you can ask along these same lines is, um, do the gravitational waves and light, do they see the same universe? And by this, I mean something very specific, which is, um, do they see this, for example, the same number of dimensions in the universe? And, and so there are theories which say that maybe, you know, the electromagnetic fields are confined to a brain and, and the gravitational fields can leak out into the bulk. Um, and this kind of comes naturally out of string theory. And so you can ask, well, do we have a test of this? And we showed that we do. And that's, you have some inferred distance. Um, and so there's some inferred luminosity, like if the gravitational waves are leaking, they'll, they'll be less loud, they'll be fainter by the time they get to, to Earth, and we can check if they're fainter or not. And there's a way, I'll, I'll skip this, there's a way to quantify this, but we showed that you can actually infer the number of space-time dimensions, it should be three plus one, on scales of tens of megaparsecs, so this is on cosmological scales, and sure enough, we end up with, you know, you know, it's consistent with four space-time dimensions. This is just from the gravitational wave and electromagnetic observations. You just ask how many dimensions are there in the universe? Three plus one. And I think that's also remarkable. <laughs> just kind of comes out of nowhere um, that you can measure this on these scales. Um, and so I think that's quite interesting. There's a bunch of other stuff I'll skip. Um, you can also measure the equation state of neutron stars by looking very carefully at the waveforms. Um, I'm gonna skip this, it it's, gets quite technical, but you have different expressions for what the neutron star equation state can be. And then you can look at different densities, this is the saturation, nuclear saturation density, or at higher densities and try to compare whether the data is being informative or not. Um, and so, there are different ways to do this. This is density versus pressure, which is the classic equation of state plot. And here is where we think the neutron stars in 1708-17 lie. Um, you can also do it as mass as a function of radius. Um, you can ask questions. Um, one of the main topics of interest for me is how does the universe make binary neutron stars? Um, yeah and uh, black holes and neutron stars, but uh, especially neutron stars, that's something we really don't understand yet, um, how to get the rates of binary neutron stars to agree with the observations. Um, and so um, uh, this is just, this is a more kind of observational project, so I thought I'd, I'd throw it in just to give you yet a, a, another way to think about gravitational wave data. Um, and the idea here is, you're making binary neutron stars. You want it. We're detecting the final, the neutron stars as they in spiral and merge. You need some story for how the neutron stars were made in the early universe and ended up in binaries that we then detect when they merge. And the normal story is you make a bunch of stars, the stars collapse and make a bunch of neutron stars. Those neutron stars then eventually merge. And you can describe that by here's the distribution of stars 
where we're making stars, star formation rate as a function of redshift. And then there's some delay time. You make the stars, it takes a while for them to, you know, turn into neutron stars and merge, and we'll just parameterize that. And then we just fit all the data that way. And it's kind of a very simple model. And um, this is some work I thought, you know, it was kind of fun. I was on sabbatical um, at Stanford, and this was led by uh, Susmita Adhikari, who actually is coming as a postdoc to Chicago. Um, and this was mainly with Risa Wexler's group at, at Stanford. Um, and, and the idea was, you know, the, the following, which is, um, okay, we have these binary systems, we get some information in gravitational waves, but it's very hard to figure out what's really going on just from the gravitational waves. Um, but that's not all we have in some cases, like 170817, we also have the host galaxy. And so the question we asked is, what does the host galaxy tell us about how these binary neutron stars are formed? And we call this the binary host connection. And we showed, which I'm still shocked by, is that even with a few measurements of the host galaxies, what the properties are of the host galaxies, we can learn about how these binary neutron stars are made. Um, and I'm going to skip this. Um, I'll just point out, and this is Janet is very familiar with this. Here is NGC 4993. Um, and this little box is, you know, where the kilonova was associated with GW170817. You can then study the properties of this host galaxy, and from it, you can learn about how neutron stars are made in the universe. And in particular, this one host galaxy suggests, I mean, it's only one, again, it's, there's a lot of statistics here, you need a population, but it suggests that the time delay between when the neutron stars are made and when they merge is pretty long, you know, on the order of a few gig years. Um, from that one galaxy, just to make that galaxy work with a model, this is what you find. Um, so I think that's fascinating. Again, it's a whole different way to use gravitational wave data. Um, um, so this is my, what I'm kind of most excited about, which is how do you stand up science to measure cosmology, to learn about cosmology. Um, I'm guessing you heard a lot about this from Marcelli. Um, I will just pick a few results in this um, and then I'll conclude. Um, and so um, the first thing I'll remind you is, you know, cosmology is not done. The field is still active. And in particular, right now, there's a raging debate about the value of the Hubble constant. Um, and it devolves into two camps. There's the kind of what we call the local universe camp using mostly type 1a supernovae, though there are other ways to do this measurement um, that find kind of high values of the Hubble constant. And then there's the CMB camp and the cosmic microwave background camp finds somewhat low values of the Hubble constant. And you can see that the errors don't overlap. And, and so as you go along, and this has just become more and more extreme, and now, depending on who you talk to, it's on the order of four sigma tension or discrepancy between these values of the Hubble constant. And that could be a hint. I mean, this is one of the things about science in general. We don't know if this is just some systematic and it's kind of, you know, boring, like it's something we don't understand about supernovae or there's some you know, foreground issue in cosmic microwave background or who knows what, something pedestrian that we still need to understand, or whether this is a hint that there's something between the early universe and the late universe that isn't as we expect. And actually this is our, our wedge into blowing apart the whole standard model of cosmology. And right now I would say, we don't know um, what, what's going on. I think it's pretty clear there is a discrepancy. Um, and we don't have a, a compelling explanation yet for why. And yeah, everyone has their own favored ideas, but it, it's, it's not resolved. And so having a clean measurement of the Hubble constant is a big deal. Um, and needless to say, this is all a way to say, we can do this with gravitational wave sources. And, and that's what we, we would call these standard sirens, which is a way to calibrate um, the Hubble constant and measure distances. And, I don't have time to go into all of it. The, the main thing here is we have this theory of general relativity. It seems to work. And it makes very clear predictions for what the gravitational wave should be. And in particular, for a given binary, how loud the gravitational waves are. 
So if we measure the gravitational wave signal, we can infer a scale on the signal from the frequency evolution, the sound of that chirp. And from measuring that chirp, we can infer, we get two things. We measure the shape of the chirp, that gives us the scale. And we measure how loud the chirp is in our detector, that gives us the distance. And it's calibrated by general relativity. There's no distance ladder. It's just a direct boom. That's how far that source is. And so that's very, very powerful. And we've used that. And this is my favorite plot ever. This is our measurement of the Hubble constant from GW170817. And it's just the very, very first time we were able to do this. It's not a great measurement. Here it is. You know, we find a value around 70. But I mean, this is just relativity. And we measure some gravitational waves, and we got the redshift from Chen. And by that having that combination, here we go. Um, we have this, you know, measurement of the Hubble constant. Um, it's the first. It kind of agrees, but it doesn't. Dis you know, it doesn't distinguish between these two values. But as we get more, especially because this is non-Gaussian, will converge quickly. And so that's something where you can stay tuned for the future as we get more of these systems we'll start to have a precision, you know, percent level measurement of the Hubble constant. Okay, and uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of details here about, if we actually do more, we measure the Hubble constant and that's very important for understanding cosmology and dark energy and dark matter. Um, and then eventually we actually do better and we can measure the full um, distribution. And I'm just gonna skip over this stuff. Um, there's some stuff about calibration, which I'm gonna skip over. Um, I'm going to mention one last thing having to do with standard sirens, and then I'll conclude. And that's um, this parent stability standard siren. It's just, again, it gives you some sense of you know, the field is wide open. So there's so many new ways to do things. And this is one example, um, which is I mentioned that there's this cutoff in the mass distribution that we're missing the big black holes. So put 1905-21 aside for now. All the other black holes we've seen kind of peter out. So this is the mass distribution of the more massive black hole in the binary. And we see them you know, from about 10 all the way over to about 40, and then it drops precipitously. No matter how you do the analysis, the number of binary black holes above 40 drops. Um, and so the question now is, you know, what, okay, that's a feature. Can we use that feature? And, and the point is, yes, this is like an absorption feature in an electromagnetic spectrum. Now we have a feature in the black hole mass distribution, <laughs> that feature redshifts, so we can use that feature to measure cosmology. Um, and we didn't even know that feature for sure existed, but now the data says there is a feature there, and now we can use it to actually measure not only the Hubble constant, but the full evolution history of the universe. And what we show in this paper is that you get at high redshift, redshifts of say around 0.75, you get measurements at the level of a few percent um, with advanced LIGO. So this is the configuration we expect in about three, four, five years, something like that. Um, and then as you measure that, you're actually gonna measure the full expansion history of the universe just using this feature and then measuring distance to each binary in turn. So this, we don't need electromagnetic counterparts. with binary black holes it's a way to you know, do cosmology with binary black holes, which I think is fascinating um, and completely new. Okay. Um, okay, so I think what I'm gonna do is skip over the, there are some other results I was gonna discuss, but I'll skip over those for now. And I'll just, you know, here's a slide of the group. These are, you know, um, the people doing all the work at UChicago you know, for most of the results I presented. Um, this is Jose, who's a you know, postdoc uh, Einstein fellow at UChicago. This is Reed Essek, who's a KICP fellow, who will be heading to Perimeter uh, probably sometime uh, in January. There are issues with visas and the pandemic. Um, Bob Wald, who's a you know, classical relativist, um, swore he'd never get his hands dirty with data, but we managed to suck him into some LIGO, and he's getting involved in tests of GR. Um, Amanda Farah is a new graduate student um, in the group, and she's done a bunch of work on gamma ray burst and is getting involved in stochastic work. Um, Maya Fishbach, who uh, uh, co-authored many of the results um, 
I, I presented, and Zohe Doctor, a, a former student who's now a, a postdoc at the University of Oregon. Um, and here we are having our socially distanced group gathering. Um, uh, just, you know, it's been nice to get together on occasion. Um, uh, it's just been a very exciting time within LIGO, and it's, you know, you kind of want to share it, and it works better in person. Um, okay, and so uh, uh, thanks. I, I think it's time for me to end, so I'm happy to stick around a little while and answer questions. Great. Thank you, Dan. That was a well, especially for me, but I hope for everyone else, a really interesting talk. It's great to see what, what you've been up to recently. Um, so I, it turns out that I cannot see the chat. I know we said that I could ask the questions that are in the chat. So if people want to just um, ask questions. <laughs> um, I, think, yeah, I, and I, I think that Daniel said that he has a constraint that he needs to leave in 10 minutes or so. So Daniel, yeah, you just... Let us know when you need to. Today. Yeah, I think I need to leave at 11.30. That's right. Let me make sure that's right. But yes, I mean, I, uh, 11.30. 15 minutes. I, I have a question along the same line, actually, the previous one. So you mentioned Hubble constant and said there is like four sigma discrepancies. But give an example you provided with a black hole where difference is just way many sigmas. Should we actually be worried about just four sigmas? Yeah, so that's, yeah, so that, that's a, a good question that, that well, you know, and this is, again, I think one of the major things in science in general is, you know, what is an interesting discrepancy and what is not interesting? And it's an art to know the difference. Um, um, so I think for, for this particular case, uh, for the, for example, the cosmic microwave background measurements, those measurements are you know, very precise and it's hard to come up with systematics that would shift the numbers significantly. And I think the community you know, kind of agrees with that. It's just, it's hard. It's such a clean, clean, relatively clean measurement. Um, the supernovae um, are also, I mean, there you can imagine many more ways to shift the distance ladder and mess things up. But you know, a lot of work has been done. You can cut the sample in various ways and throw things out and do all, and it really seems to be robust. Um, and so that four sigma, I think many in the community view as it's a real problem. There really is something wrong. Um, but, you know, right, if there's some on, on systematic that is messing up the supernova, then maybe you can shift it. I should also say there are other measurements along the way. There are other ways to measure the Hubble constant. And they also lead to, you know, you can use lensing, um, uh, and they also kind of fall into these two camps. In general, there's some sort of discrepancy. Now, just to really muddy the waters, there's another way to do all this stuff, which is using the tip of the red giant branch. And that's something that Wendy Freeman um, at Chicago has been very involved in. And, and their measurement comes in right kind of in the middle at around 70. So you could think, well, maybe the resolution is you're just in the middle and you just have to shift these other measurements by two sigma each. It's still really hard to do that. So who knows? Um, it's all a long-winded way to, to say who knows. But in that community, I would say there really is, people have been trying for a few years now to make the discrepancy go away. And, and I don't think there's a compelling way to do that yet. So we'll see. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, I would say I can see if people raise hands, I can see that for what it's worth. Um, I have a question. So why would we expect a mass gap between the heaviest neutron star and the lightest black hole? So like what would happen to a, a binary system um, with an accreting neutron star that does exceed the maximum neutron star mass? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. Um, you know, should there even be a lower mass gap in the first place? And so in principle, if you, if you created a binary neutron star um, and, you know, it might be spinning and there's, it's accreting and you might get, you know, a hypermassive neutron star for a little while and then eventually it collapses to a black hole, and then if there's no further accretion, the black hole could just be just a little beyond the mass of the neutron star. 
And so you could certainly come up with a story where that happens and you fill the, you know, you fill this whole area above. You have black holes at 2.5 or three solar masses all the way up. And that could easily be the case. Um, and we haven't seen um, any compelling black hole candidates in that region so far. Um, so, you know, you can ask, well, you know, why is that? And would we have expected to see them? And then people argue, well, it's just selection effects. Actually, there could be a lot of them there, but because of the way we do the observations, we don't naturally detect them. Um, but I think that's not settled in the community. And so I think in the observational community, there's a debate, but, you know, a lot of people think, well, it looks like there's a gap observationally. On the theory side, it's more complicated. You can come up with models for the supernovae, which you know, either give you gaps or not, depending on details of the physics and how fast you know, the, the instabilities develop. Um, so you can have some models where by the time you go supernova, there's no more, you know, there's not, nothing else happens and you can create little black holes and others where at the end of it, the black hole has to be at least five solar masses um, just because if it's below that, you shut all the material, you end up with a neutron star, um, and, and it's just, you, you can't tune things to end up right in the gap. But that's very detailed modeling, and I don't think anyone would be shocked either way. Um, but okay, we, we, we don't know. Thanks. I was going to ask another question. This is Nick. Um, on your doing the cosmology between redshift of one and five with the, the cutoff at 40 some odd solar masses. That's very interesting. I do have to question though, we don't know almost anything about mass loss in stars. And so if mass loss is a function of metallicity, you're going to change the core mass significantly yeah. over that redshift range. So there's a lot of, it's kind of dirty, but in some sense, interesting astrophysics that has to be yeah. done locally, understanding mass loss because that's a, that's a big unknown in all these supernova models. Totally. So, yeah, and I should say, you know, I mean, on the supernova side, and uh, Nick is the person, so you should correct me if I said anything wrong. And that's an extremely good point. So we don't understand the, the in detail, we don't understand the physics behind parent stability supernovae. And in particular, metallicity is one of the major issues that could change things. Now, what... What people have said, and I'm thinking, for example, uh, Selma de Minx group, um, you know, at Harvard, she's done some work uh, trying to look at how much this can vary, and there are a number of other recent papers. And the argument has been that it's pretty robust to metallicity changes. Um, and so you just don't expect um, that much of a shift in the position of the gap. But that's a possible systematic, and if it shifts, just like you would expect, you know, H of Z to shift, you know, the dark A, then, you know, there's no way to tell them apart. And so, you know, in what, what I've presented, um, we assume there was no shift at all and no systematic, and that's dangerous for sure. Um, I'll just point out one other thing. In addition to the actual position of the gap, there's the width of the gap, and the width of the gap is also supposed to be quite robust. And that's supposed to be robust to metallicity changes. So the whole thing could shift but the width should stay the same, and that might be something we can measure, and that's part of this jumping the gap um, project with uh, Jose. So, um, uh, yeah, I, we don't know, and we'll need you know, more data to figure this out, but that's well, a, idea, a very idea, valid point, and I don't yeah. want to oversell. It's the, the idea possible. is really cool. I never would have thought of it, so it's a really great idea. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty neat, but you know, it may not work in practice. And then I think you're right. We'll learn a lot about you know, metallicity effects of you know, parent stability supernova, which itself is super cool and fascinating. Yeah, excellent point. Uh, maybe one more quick question. If, if you do um, an F test, comparing the fit to the 6585 solar mass model and the, the 30, uh, 130, 140 solar mass model, what um, are they within the statistical error or do you, is it in the F test, do you get a P value less than 0.05? Yeah, so I usually think of it in terms of base factors and the base factor in favor of the more equal mass case is, 
less than 10. So, you know, it's a question of, you know, do you believe your priors at a confidence of 10 to one or something? So, so that's to say the data marginally prefers the values, the uninformed values, the 65, 85 values for the black hole masses, but it's, it, it has no problem with, you know, 45 and 120 either, and, and both fit about as well. Um, I should mention, you know, one thing to keep in mind with this is, for example, unlike the binary neutron star, for very massive binaries, black hole binaries, we only get a few cycles before they merge. So we don't get as much data. We get maybe three or four oscillations and then a ring down. And so um, they're not as well constrained, which is part of the reason either of the, you know, you have this wide range in possible masses, um, just because there's just not as much to work with in terms of the waveform. Um, but that, yeah, that's a, it's a good, that's a good point. And, you know, I would not claim we've shown it straddles the gap, um, but I would also not claim that we've shown they're both in the gap. Um, it's kind of inconclusive. Interesting. All right, should we let Daniel go? Maybe we can all give him a virtual round of applause. Thanks, everyone. Um, Good try. It's, <laughs> uh, it's not nice to see you all, and I'm really sorry it's not there in person. But well, maybe, maybe sometime next time. in the future. Yes, yes. I hope so. All right, okay. Dave, thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Bye, everyone. <laughs>